und ins Tanzen rein. Das sind weiter Lord. Lord, we welcome you in this place tonight. We've come to meet with you. We've come to feel your presence. We've come to embrace you and be embraced by your great love and your mercy. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all of the wonderful gifts that you've given us. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for our blood flowing through our veins and our bodies being in health. Relative to so many people who have so many problems, we really have it good because of your providence, because of your mercy that is new every morning. And we're grateful for it. Through the good times and the bad times, you are on your throne and you rule over us. You reign over us in righteousness. We are the subjects of your kingdom. We come to yield to the king tonight, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We bow before you, Lord, and we worship you. We're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for you, Lord. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth.
senses We let it burn Spirit is flowing 
is calling upon his name. Is there anybody who's stirring up himself the label of God? Lord, look no further. We are here. We are calling upon the name of Jesus. And Lord, we are stirring ourselves up to lay hold of you. For you are the best. Lord, we will lay hold of you this very night. Lord, we want to lay hold of you this very night. Oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Speak, speak to us. In Jesus' name, we all pray and say, Amen. Last week, we talked about calling upon the name of the Lord, right? The previous week, um, no, we... Um, the, the Lord just stirred my, stirred my spirit up to say that He want me to focus on uh, the spirit activities for this one month. Right? So, um, see, it is strange. Every time I finish a message, the Lord will then show me what to preach for the next message. So, um, I'm, I'm glad that the Lord lead me in, in such a way. Now, I want to talk about something. Whenever, whenever we go, let's say go around, and introduce ourselves to someone. How will you? How would we introduce ourselves? We will say what? I am so and so, and I I do what? Right, right. We say I am Paul. I am so and so. I and this is what I do. We say I'm I'm Stephen Young. I'm uh, 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 I, I work for the church. I I'm also I'm also an educator or whatever. Oh you no, know, you you may you may say something in relation to what you do. But don't you find this a very strange thing? That is, for the people who shake hands with you, they want to know straight away what you do, not really who you are. Now, let's try something new. I don't know whether we dare to try this or not. Let's try to counter trend in society. Would you dare to walk to someone and say, I am Paul, I'm a very joyful person, I like sport, I like to swim. You, you see how the people react. I think people will feel very uneasy, right? I mean, because, because it is expected of us, whenever we shake hands with someone, we have to introduce ourselves by what job we hold. Right? And people don't know, oh, who are you? Are you a teacher? Are you an engineer? Are you a politician? Uh, are, you, are you what? And um, there is this very close relationship between our so-called title and our identity. Now, I have observed that this is not very good because um, there is a certain kind of identity that people are looking for, right? They want to see whether you are big shot or, or small fry. If you are small fry, they ignore you. If you are big shot, they will kowtow to you. Right? I mean, they, 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 they will kowtow you, they, 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 they say very good thing of you. Um, but it is hard to counter trend in society. No, it is hard for us if we go out there and say, oh, I'm so-and-so, I like this, I like that. And people will say, what are you? Who are you? No, are you crazy or what? No? But you see, tonight I'm going to talk about the activities of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't claim, I can't claim, to say that I know everything of the whole personality of the Holy Spirit. I'm still discovering. Um, but I want to talk about what He does. Now, in, in, a, in a matter of a few seconds, am I contradicting myself. Just now I say, you know, we should talk about who we are and not so much about what we do. But for the Holy Spirit, it's quite different. I discover that there's a big co-relationship between who He is and what He does. And He is perfect. He is not man. Man like to hide behind titles. But for the Holy Spirit, He is secure. We can talk about what He does. And many times we discover who He is through what He does. And he is totally secure, he can handle that. But for men, it is difficult because we can't handle that. So tonight I'm going to talk about the activities of the Holy Spirit. All right, but I'm not going to talk about everything because we don't have time for that. We are born forever and forever. But today I just want to talk about five main things that I've observed and studied uh, uh, on what, what he usually does. And more importantly is what he is doing and what he will do among us, and that is very relevant. Okay, number one, the spirit is always there. The spirit always birth new ministries. Let's take a look. Take a look at Genesis chapter one, verse two. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth 
was formless and empty. Darkness covered the, uh, covered the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, so you see, the earth was empty. All right? It was formless because it was covered with water. But straight away we see the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, this picture gives a connotation of an eagle flying above the water. Now, have you seen an eagle flying above the water? Do you know you can see that in Singapore? Go to Marachi Reservoir. Here you can see hawk and eagle. I, I, I've seen that before. Yeah, they will hover around and they're just circling around looking for a fish. The moment they spot something they can catch it, they'll just dive and catch the fish. Now, if you don't believe me, go to Marachi Forest and you, you just sit, sit, sit by the water for two hours. I think you will sure catch, catch uh, some sight of that. Now, so this picture likens the Spirit of God to be like an eagle hovering over the water. For what? I'm, I'm not sure the Spirit of God is not hovering over the water for something to eat. But He was hovering <laughs> over the water to prepare with concern, okay? To prepare a habitation for mankind. He was there, hovering over the waters with concern for the creation of a place for men. And the Spirit of God was already there. Okay? So, the Spirit of God was always there at the beginning. When He was birthing something, He was, uh, he was there. At the birth of every new endeavor or ministry, you will see the Spirit of God always be there. Alright, let's, let's take a look at Exodus 31, verse 1 to 5. Steve, hear it for me. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bazalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Oh. Oh, that's all right. Thanks. Okay. Now, you see, God has anointed Bazalel, this guy, filled him with the spirit, and this guy could then do all kinds of crafts work to build the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was the center focus of the nation of Israel when they were traveling around. When they came somewhere, the tabernacle must always be in the center. Now, so this was the part when God told Moses to get this guy called Bazalel, and God told him, I have filled him with the spirit. I have filled him with the Spirit, and I have, uh, I have uh, anointed this guy to do all kinds of works, to do all kinds of craft works for the tabernacle. Now, so you see, the tabernacle was formed, the tabernacle was formed by the Spirit. Now, ev everything about the tabernacle, everything about the craft work has to do with the Spirit of God. It's not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, not by might. But this thing is here, here talking. Sorry. Okay. Okay, anyway. So, you see, the tabernacle was formed through the anointing of... I know why. 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 Okay. Because the button is being pointed to the timer. That's why it's here talking. Anyway. Now, so, you see, the tabernacle was formed and the tabernacle was prepared by this guy, and this guy was filled with the Spirit. Now, you show us one, one, one thing. The ministry of Israel, the nation of Israel, was birthed by the Spirit again. Now, what is the ministry of Israel? Now, they walk around, they walk around, they're supposed to go to the Promised Land, and they are supposed to reveal the glory of God. They're supposed to bring the presence of God to the nations. And so, you see, the tabernacle was a centerpiece. The tabernacle was a place where God will come and dwell among the people. And the, the, the ministry of Israel is to reveal His glory. And everything about the beginning of the tabernacle, about the beginning of their ministry, has to do with the Spirit. Here again we see the ministry of Israel was birthed by the Spirit. It was not because Moses called all the elders together and they have some great ideas. No, but it's because the Spirit gave birth to the ministry of Israel. Now, I don't have talked much about the New Testament church. 
We've been studying the book of Acts, right? In Acts chapter 2, the church was birthed by the Spirit. It was not because the apostles and the, the, the other disciples, they all gather around for 10 days, they discuss, they discuss and know how to uh, promote their plans or their gospel. It's, it's, it's not that. It was waiting upon the Spirit, and the Spirit came, and the church was born. You know, I was quite shocked to hear that there was a major denomination in the U.S. They recently gathered all the senior pastors of the churches, and they talked about rebranding the denomination. They invited non-Christian consultants to come and have a few day con a conference of a few days, and they talked about what they can do to attract more people. So they came up with very big programs. Every church building must be repainted. They must have a rock band in every youth group, and and it was a big hoo-ha thing. And they think that that will bring on revival and bring on more souls. It must be by the birth of the Spirit that ministry will arise. Before anything new, you can always observe the Spirit of God doing something. Now let's take a look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. The gold lampstand and the two olive trees then the angel who, I'm sorry, that's the title to the passage, it's identical to the rest of the passage, okay. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand on it with channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it. God bless it. Thanks. Now you see, we, many of us, we have quoted this verse many times, not by power, not by, 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 by the Spirit. All right, we use it in spiritual warfare, and we, we can quote it left, right, center. But you see, the context was about the rebuilding of the second temple. The exiles has come back, it was in the year of 530 BC. Joshua was the high priest, Jerubbabel was the leader of the people. And Zechariah was commissioned by God, was anointed by God to go and prophesy over Jerubbabel. And the word to Jerubal is this, the rebuilding of the second temple is not to be accomplished by power and might, but by the spirit. Yes, there were physical hard work, ding, 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 dang, dang, and everything. All right, there, 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 there are a lot of things to do, but it is by the spirit of God that the second temple were to be rebuilt. So again, we see, before anything of God, the Spirit is always there, birthing new things. Now, even when we prepare servants, now Steve and I have shared, no, we don't sit there, start dreaming, start thinking, hey, yeah, this is a good idea. We don't go through, you know, uh, uh, references and say, hey, what, what, what to preach, you know, and so we, 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 we don't go through things like that. We wait upon God. And when God says, speak about this, we say, yes, sir. You know, there are some Bible schools, or many Bible schools, you know what they will teach you? They will teach you to do this. Go and analyze, about, uh, analyze your group. Go and find out about their needs. Go and talk to them, interview them, and then you draft out your servants. That's how they will teach you. But I will advocate listening to the Lord, listening to the Spirit, for the Spirit is keen to birth new ministries, to birth new messages among us. And it's by the Spirit of God, not by power, not by might. There was a church in the United States. This pastor and his church was trying to plant a cell group in a university. For two years, they tried and tried and tried with all kinds of strategy and tactics. They couldn't start a cell group. One day, the, the pastor listened to the Lord and the Lord said, drop everything and just send your people into the university. Just take a walk. So he sent his people in, they just took a walk, they found a group of students doing Bible study. They joined them, and the group of, uh, the group of students said, can you help us? Another girl went around and saw some girls talking about the Bible. They knew nothing about the Bible, but they just talked about the Bible. And so the girl sat there and said, can, can I share something with you? And within two weeks, they formed two cell groups in the universities. For two years, they were trying to do something, but they failed. But when the Spirit lead them, 
Well, they planted two sapwood within two weeks. So, people, the spirit is always building new things. In 06 Jan January, the Lord birthed in me the vision of a new church, Church Alive Ministry. In 09 September, the Lord uh, birthed in Steve Nico about a Sunday church. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure Eliza going to Mexico was birth of a spirit. Some, something from the spirit must have gripped her heart. No, and it birth, gave birth to the ministry in Mexico. Cynthia has gone up to Cambodia, it was birth of a spirit. Yamel, uh, uh, Francel, and now Caleb's going to the Philippines. It's all birthed by the spirit. And I pray that we be so keen to be pregnant, to be pregnant by the spirit. Yeah. I pray that we will be so keen to desire something new in your life. This is a new year. I pray that we will be so keen to say, God, give birth through me. Something new. I pray we'll be so eager to say, God, here am I. I'm ready. Oh, birth something new through me. The Spirit is watching. The Spirit is hovering. The Spirit is preparing to give birth to new ministries. And one thing I really, really um, feel very privileged with God is this. His love and mercy is new every morning. And I know that every day there's new opportunity. Every day there's, there can be new things of God. I don't have to live on the stale bread of yesterday. I don't even have to live on the past glory or the past hurts. Every day is new. And therefore, I expect new things, new ministry, new things. Yeah, yes, yesterday I was at, at somebody's house and just sharing about uh, what we do here. And that person invites me to start something new with her group of intercessors. Well, her house got a basement, you know. Well, she has built a basement, especially for, for worship. And she said, uh, can you come and start something new with my group of uh, intercessors? I said, sure. And, uh, well, and I'm, I'm glad. Something new. Am I always watching for something new? You know why? Because the Spirit is very keen to birth something new. And I pray that we will arise with God. Say, God, what are you doing? What are the new things that you're going to do? And can I be included? Birth these new things through me. Then we will not, we will not go on and say, uh, church is boring. We will not go on and say, there's nothing much. Oh, if you are daring, there will be many new things for you and me. Alright, number two. The Spirit teach and remind. Now this, of course we know, huh? we know the Holy Spirit is the teacher. But I want to share this with you. It's because the other day I was just talking with Stephen Young and... Um, Actually, we are quite concerned because sometimes we hear some of you saying, oh, I don't understand the Bible and I really don't understand, really, really, I also don't understand. You know what? We have the best teacher in the whole universe, the Holy Spirit. You, we have the Holy Spirit with us, teaching us. And if you are open, if you go to Him and listen to Him and seek Him, He will teach because He's the best teacher. Yeah, he may refer you to read something extra. He may refer you to read some other materials. But he is the best teacher. And he's the one with the most resources. So don't give up and say, I read and read, I still don't understand. Of course, if you're reading King James Version always, then maybe you may get stuck. <laughs> Try and read New Living Translation. It's very simple. If you still cannot read uh, like what uh, the message, that is very, very simple. All right, the, 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 the teacher, the best teacher with us can teach. Unless you doubt his teaching qualification. Unless you say, oh no, maybe he can't teach me, you know. I'm too stupid to be taught. No, God can teach. Now let me give you uh, an, an example uh, that I have learned. First uh, Corinthians chapter 14. Now First Corinthians chapter 14 is a passage that describes what a meeting uh, in the church uh, uh, should look like. Okay, Paul talked about it. And um, many people have quoted from this passage to form certain doctrines. Now, if you listen to everyone, you will get very confused. Okay, you need the Holy Spirit to really teach you. I've been reading this passage for how many years and I'm still re learning something new from the Spirit. Okay, now verse 33. Paul said what? For we have a God not of disorder, but a God of peace. Now, in the congregation of, of God's people. Now, Many people would then quote from this. See, 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 see. You see, Paul said there is a God of peace and not disorder. Therefore, now therefore, 
they took this, they take this first, and therefore they say that we must sit in rows, and uh, and therefore everything must be organized from minute to minute. There must be an order, a service, you know, 7 p.m., 7 to 7.30 worship, 7.30 to 7.35 uh, giving, 7.35 sermon, by 8.15 should close, and close with benediction. And everything must be, what we say in Hokkien, sweet, sweet. Everything must be nice, perfect. No, that's what it means, sweet, sweet, yeah, in Hokkien. If, uh, yeah. No, so, so you see, so they say, we must do this because verse 33 says that God is a God uh, of peace. Now, you know what I've learned from the Spirit? I've learned that if you want to take a look at 1 Corinthians 14, you cannot take one verse here and there. You must look at the whole passage. The same people who quote these passages, they never quote the whole chapter. It is an exciting chapter talking about what uh, must take place in a church meeting. All right, and, 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 and so that, 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 this is what I learned. They say that we must have order and so on and so forth, but when we take a look at it, Paul says what? In, is verse 26 there? Is it there? Is that right? Now I say, uh, Paul, Paul says what? When you have a town, when you have a revelation, no, when you come together, you do it to build up the church. The same people who quote verse 33 will never quote verse 26. Right? Now, lesson, lesson number one, that is, don't take uh, verses here and there. Look at the entire passage. And it, is, it talks about an exciting church meeting. Okay? Now, lesson number two, verse 18 and 19. Paul says, I speak, I thank God that I speak uh, in tongues more than all of you, you know, and, uh, but in a church meeting, I rather speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in the tongue. And some people jump on it. See, 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 see. Paul says, don't speak in tongue. Now again, if you... If we, if we don't learn from the Spirit, if we just selectively read the passage, you would think that, yeah, this is justification of Paul saying that we should not speak in tongue. But what does verse 26 say? Speak in tongue. And you know what's my latest lesson? No, I tell you, I've been reading this for so long, and suddenly the Spirit illuminated my mind. When Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, it means that when he was with them, he also spoke in tongues. That means, in their meetings, he spoke in tongues. So if Paul spoke in tongues, who said Paul say? Who said that Paul said that we cannot speak in tongues? Now this is, the, this, is the late, this is the latest. I've never seen this in this life. But the, day, the other day I was reading here and there, reading uh, this passage, re reading some of the books. I realized, oh, when Paul said this, he was speaking in tongues among them. Or else he could not qualify himself, right? And Paul spent one and a half year with the Corinthian church. You can read this in Acts chapter 18. He spent one and a half year uh, there. Now, so Paul said, I spoke in tongues more than all of you. But why? But what was what, what he saying? He was saying that, I want to instruct, I want to teach, and therefore i rather speak five intelligible words than that, after 10,000 words in tongues. But he never, he never forbid the speaking in tongues. Verse 39, he said, don't forbid the speaking of tongue. So I learned, oh, Paul spoke more in tongues in their meetings. And if Paul did that, then it is all right for me. But what he was warning was that the Corinthian church went too excessive. You know, even when someone teach, 20, 30 people would just speak in tongues. And nobody was listening. They were too carried away. That's why Paul was instructing them and saying, please, no. If I want to teach you, you also must learn how to uh, uh, keep quiet and let's do things in order. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. Through this example, I'm learning things afresh from the Spirit every time I read 1 Corinthians 14. And you know my conclusion is what? I would like, and I'm sure Steve will agree with me, I would like to follow 1 Corinthians 14 to the dot. You you, 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 you have a revelation, you share. You have a tongue, you share. You have an interpretation, you share. And uh, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about when we prophesy, non-Christians who walk in, they will fall down and worship God. That is what I want to learn. And that is what I want to see. Now, just, a, just, just an example in case. So I'm trying to, trying to tell you this. That is, the Holy Spirit teach. The Holy Spirit keep on teaching. And uh, I thank God that I have such a good teacher. He's the best teacher in the whole universe. And the Holy Spirit will remind you and me of what 
um, uh, of what Jesus has said. John 14 verse 26. Is John 14 verse 26? Is that? Or have I missed a slide? Sorry, I have too, too much Chinese food. <laughs> Oh, you're a pastor. Okay, and anyway, all right. Anyway, John. Okay, in John 14 verse 26, Jesus said, the, "The Holy Spirit will teach us, and He teach you all things, and He remind you of everything I've said to you." Now, in in China in 2010, when the lady brought her son to me to to ask me to pray for her son team to be dropped, I was stunned for a while. But I suddenly remember in my in my mind, yes, the Lord say what in John chapter 14 verse 12, whoever believes in Him can do greater things than Jesus. So I exercise my faith and pray, and I say, may your teeth be dropped. And the next day, his teeth was dropped. So the Lord, the Holy Spirit can remind us of, of things. All right? So he's the best teacher, and he reminds us of things when we need it. Sometimes we may just forget, but just at the, I would say, in the nick of time, the Lord will just remind you of things. Okay? Now let's move on. The Holy Spirit is the one who moves us to prophesy. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Would you For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, so you see, Peter was saying that no one prophesied according to his own spirit. He must be moved by God, impelled by God, and therefore he started to prophesy. Now, what kind of prophecy is he talking about? He's talking about prophetic utterance, word of encouragement. That suddenly, or when you, the Spirit leads you, the Spirit empower you, you open, when you open your mouth, you can speak forth the words of God, the oracles of God for a certain situation or for a person. And the Lord can just move you to speak. And the main point is that the Spirit moves us to prophesy. Now, then, of course, prophecy can be foretelling, meaning I can, by the Spirit of God, tell what is happening to you. Or sometimes the Lord may just drop me certain things to tell, to, to, to what we do, what we say, foretelling. I, I can speak of certain things in the future, what I see in the Spirit in the future, because God can see everything. Now, the whole thing is this, God moves us to prophesy. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39 to 40, Paul says, be eager to prophesy. And I pray that we be so eager to prophesy. I pray that we be so tuned to the Spirit that we will say to God, God, use me today to prophesy. Yeah. Yesterday, when I was at the person's house, I was all prepared to prophesy. Because the night before I was praying, and I saw a vision. I saw a vision of a lady wearing green. I thought my hopes would have invited a lot of friends. But when I went there, oh, I discovered that she only invited me and Caleb. So we have a lunch with the family, and she wore a dress with green patterns. I was so ready to prophesy. I gave myself up to prophesy because I find that when we prophesy, it will encourage many souls and it will benefit many people and it may bring on Christians coming to worship God. That's so why when I take that, I say, I'm all geared up to prophesy. I mean, when I sit there, I say, God, tell me today, would you want, give me a word for this taxi driver or not? Many times, the Lord will give me a word, but sometimes the Lord will say, today, nothing. Okay, then I'll just keep quiet. So be eager to prophesy. And the Lord will move us to prophesy. I pray that one fine day when we, um, when we gather, oh, the Spirit of God will be upon us that we will prophesy left, right, center until the non-Christian will bow down and worship God. I pray the Spirit of God will just fall upon us that we will be so eager to prophesy. Four point. Four point. Judges, Chapter 13, verse 24 to 25. See. And the woman in due time bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in Mahanadan, the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. Okay, now. Now, if you see that I'm a bit disconnected today, you know why? Because I sense that the Lord's going to move at certain point. So maybe I was in a hurry, you know. Point four. This is where I'm trying to come to. 
Point four. The Spirit of the Lord will stir and will move. Now, if you take a look at these verses, the growth of Samson seems to be shortcutted, alright? But, but then we see, oh, the Spirit of the Lord moves Samson and stir him up. Now, this word has the same connotation in Daniel chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Can you please? In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Now, the word stirring that is found in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, the word stir actually carry the same connotation as in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, when the king say, I'm troubled. Now that means, when the Spirit of the Lord stirs us or moves us, it is as though the Spirit of the Lord is troubling or disturbing us with dreams. Now, it, it, it is actually the same meaning, right? It is the same connotation. Now, I'm very glad that the Lord is eager to trouble you and me. I'm very glad the Lord is eager to move or stir you and me. And I'm very glad the Lord wants to stir you and me. He wants to stir you and me because He wants us to arise with Him to do great things with Him. And before, before, before great exploits happen, you will find the stirring of the Spirit. Last week, I talked about we stirring ourselves to lay hold of God. Today, I'm talking about the Spirit of God stirring us or moving us to do great things of God. The question is, are you prepared to be stirred? Are you prepared to be stirred by the Spirit of God? Are you open and say, God, stir me? Or trouble me? Be careful, you may have insomnia. You may lay awake for the whole night, be stirred by the Spirit of God. I remember January the 5th, 2006, when the Spirit of God stirred me about the new vision of the church. I could not sleep. I just ended up, end up typing the, uh, uh, the, uh, up the whole new vision for the whole church in the early morning hours. November uh, 2010, my spirit was stirred. I remember the very phone call I had with Steve. I called him up, he was on the MRT train, and he shared me that his spirit was so stirred that we both felt that God was, do, was going to do something big, and he shared me about these sparks of fire, uh, sparks of revival fire coming to Church Alive Ministry. And one month later, in December 2010, it happened. People, there's always this stirring of the spirit of God. There's always this stirring of the Spirit. Stirring of the Spirit. The Lord will stir our hearts. I pray, I pray we be ready to be stirred by God. I pray that we be open and say, God, stir me. Yes. Oh, I pray in Jesus' name that your hearts will be stirred. You will be moved. You will be troubled. You will be disturbed in the night because of the vision that will pass through your mind. Because of dreams that the Lord will give you. Because of the impression the Lord will deposit in your spirit that you'll be so troubled. And you have no peace until you arise with God and say, God, here am I. I obey you. I follow you. Oh, how good is it to be stirred by God? How good is it to be moved by the Spirit of God? If you read about Samson, Samson was one of the judges that have that has always been stirred by the Spirit. In one passage, uh, Samuel chapter 14, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, he was stirred by the Spirit, and uh, he was moved by the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and it tore a lion to pieces. Wow. Have you seen a lion before? I've heard the real roar of a lion in Mandai Zoo. I tell you, even though the roar was for about 200 meters away, my leg trembled. It was fierce. But Samson, when he was stirred by the Spirit, when he was moved by the Spirit, he tore that lion to pieces. You know what? God is stirring people here. God is going to move some people here to do great things with God. Are you prepared to be stirred? Do you want to be stirred? <laughs> do you want to be stirred? I'd rather you be stirred than you not be stirred. I'd rather you be a uh, 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 a cup of fresh coffee that is stirred than a stagnant cup of coffee. I rather that my spirit is stirred and I lose some sleep than not being stirred. 
You know why? Because God is looking out for people that He can stir. Oh, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name that you will be stirred. You and I will be stirred to do the great works of God. You will come with a price. You will feel whole. You will feel uncomfortable. You will feel angst. You feel excitement. You, your mind will always be, oh God, you're talking about this thing. I'm not talking about unrest, no. I'm talking about like, ah, um, oh, something is in your heart. And you'll be stirred. But it's exciting. All right, number, number five. The Holy Spirit will revive. Now we read Ezekiel chapter 37, verse one to 11. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. <laughs> he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? Yes. I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you. You will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and yeah. tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Yes. If you read it technically, yes, it is reserved for the time of our people of Israel who are feeling so dry. But of course, through the ages, many people have taken this passage to prophesy about the revival of the Holy Spirit. And we know, as we take a look at this verse, we can identify with this passage. Yes, there is a valley of dry bones, but I thank God that most of us are not dry here. But there's a valley of dry bones out there. Yes, there are many churches that are dry. But you see what I've learned from the Spirit? I've never learned this before until I read this passage the other day. See, the Lord said, prophesy over these dry bones, and then flesh and muscles and tendons all came upon that uh, uh, and all, all of bones. So the bodies were fall, but they were still not alive. Now, I'd like to liken this to the church. The church can have system and programs and structure, which some basic structures are important to have. But it is not enough. There was a second prophecy, and it's about a prophecy of the breath and the wind of God. That is through the Spirit of God that these people, these bones came alive. These bodies suddenly jumped up to the feet because of the breath of the, of, of the Lord, because of the wind of the Holy Spirit, that these, these bones, out of these bodies came alive. So, from here I learn again that a church may have the basic structure, but without the breath of God, without the wind of God, without the Holy Spirit, without the moving of the Spirit, without the revival of the Spirit, it will not be alive. So therefore, I know that God is always constantly looking out to pour forth His Spirit upon dry churches, upon dry people. And today I know that maybe some of us here feel a little dry, a little dry. Therefore, you need the revival of the Holy Spirit. You need the wind of God. You need the breath of God coming upon you. Now, what are you going to be revived from? You're going to be revived from dryness to what? To aliveness. The Lord is going to revive you from dryness yes. to aliveness. aliveness. If you feel dry, 
Ask for a wind of God. Ask for a breath of God. For He will bring you from dryness to aliveness. Hallelujah. Oh, I know tonight it is not just about talk. It is not about power and might, but it's about the spirit. I, tonight I'm not just going to give talk here and engage your mind. I'm not giving you intellectual assent. Tonight I'm excited because I know the spirit will do more than talking. He want to do some real work here. Is there somebody here who needs revival? Who there somebody here who needs to be revived from dryness to aliveness? Receive the breath of God. Boom, the breath of God come upon you. Whoo, the breath of God come upon you. Oh, the breath of God, the breath of God come upon you. The spirit of God fall upon you even now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I remove every dryness from your bones. In the mighty name of Jesus, the wind of God blow upon you. The wind of God, the wind of God blow upon you. Catch the wind of God. Catch the breath of God. Catch the wind of God. The Lord come upon you and revive you from dryness to aliveness. Give away dryness. Let it go. Let it go. Don't hang on to dryness. Don't be stuck and say, Ah, oh, no use, or oh, whatever you say is useless. Your dryness will just drop off you in one second when you are prepared to receive the wind of God yeah. and the breath of God. Hallelujah. Lord, come revive us. Oh, God. For those of us who are dry, there is hope. For you are the spirit that is always active. You are active. That's why today we talk about your activities. <laughs> you are always hovering around. You are preparing to birth something new. You teach. You move us from a side. You stir us. Oh God, we want to be stirred by you tonight. Stir us tonight. Lord, stir us tonight. Move us tonight. Then we will arise with you. Of us who are dry. Father, we call upon the Spirit of the Living God. We call upon the breath and the wind of God. Come, O oh God. Come. 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 Come, revive. I feel there's someone here. You have a dream given to you by God some moments ago. But it has been left on a shelf. And for a long time, you left the dream on the shelf. Tonight, the Lord want to revive the dream that He has given you. Whoever it is, go, go and take the dream out of the shelf and bring it before God and say, God, breathe upon this dream again. You will come alive. You come alive because it's by the Spirit of God. <laughs> Who is that person? If you are the one, would you come? Would you come before God and say, God, this is the dream. I lost hope. I went dry. I, I put it aside for too long. Tonight, I want to take it out again. And Lord, would you breathe upon this dream? I pray you be done according to the Spirit of God. I pray you be done according to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is an active person. He's not a spirit floating around. He's an active person. He does many great things among us. I pray tonight the Spirit will move across His hall and do His mighty work. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you come? Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, we invite you.
prophesy. Teach us your word, oh God. Oh, we want to see you so active in our lives. We welcome you to do your works. We welcome you to do your works. Oh, Jesus, we welcome you.
if you want this, I'll just ask you to come forward. I'll lay hand on you, I impart this to you. You may start having dream. And the Lord may use you to bring a word of knowledge to someone. But remember, it is not for self-gratification. It's not for you to go around and say, hey, I know what you do last night. No. It is purely to build up the church. It's purely to bring non-Christians to Christ. It's purely a gift for the common good. Remember, if you want this, I'll let it part onto you. Because I, I want to see that we can all, by the Spirit of God, prophesy. We can all, by the Spirit of God, have prophetic dreams to bring non-Christians to Christ, to bring encouragement to the Christians. And I felt that the Lord gave me the liberty today to impart this to whoever who wants this. And days to come, I am eager to hear what God may do in your lives. I pray you will go further than me because it's all for the glory of God. If you want, you come forward. I pray for you. Bye. You know, one word from the Lord can go very far. We were in the hospital one last week. We were praying, and I felt in my spirit that I would pray for Ruth. And I lay hand on her and say, start receiving vision. And straight away she caught on a vision for the leader of the ministry in the hospital. Yesterday I was with the leader of the ministry, and she said that word meant so much for her. That word, that vision that Ruth caught actually brought so much meaning to her whole family. A word from God can go very far. I pray we will be so, we will, we will be so eager to prophesy. May the Lord stir us up to prophesy, to speak the word of God, to bring vision and dreams, to bless many souls. Lord, we want to follow 1 Corinthians 14 to the dot. We want to see our meetings alive in your spirit. So Lord, may your spirit move among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Yeah.